Hi, I'm Tom Sullivan, Vice President for Small Business Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Common Grounds. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is a series where we invite a Republican leader and a Democrat leader to join us for a cup of coffee and some bipartisan conversation about what we can do together to solve some of our nation's greatest and most important challenges. Now with us today to talk about small business policy are two members of Congress who have fantastic track records of working across the political divide, finding common ground and getting things done in their communities and for our country. Congressman Dean Phillips from Minnesota and Congresswoman Young Kim from California. Congressman Phillips is a Democrat who is a self-described eternal optimist who is always in search of finding common ground. The Congressman has quite a small business background from taking Talenti Gelato to a nationally recognized ice cream brand to starting Penny's Coffee in the Twin Cities. Congressman Phillips has firsthand experience with the needs of the small business community. Currently, he serves as the vice chair of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. He is a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Ethics Committee. And for the purposes of this discussion, most importantly, he serves on the House Small Business Committee. We're also joined by Congresswoman Kim, a Republican from California, who is a proud immigrant, small business owner, community leader, and mother. Congresswoman Kim is the first Korean American woman ever to serve in Congress. She currently serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and again, most importantly, the House Small Business Committee. Congresswoman Kim started a women's clothing manufacturing company prior to being elected to Congress. Additionally, Congresswoman Kim is also a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, where she works with Congressman Phillips and colleagues across the aisle to find common ground on many of the key issues facing our nation. At the U.S. Chamber, we believe that small businesses resilience, drive and creativity fuel the American economy. Small business founders and entrepreneurs build careers. They power innovations and serve communities across the country. We are delighted to have both Congressman Phillips and Congresswoman Kim with us today to dive deeper into small business policy and how our elected leaders can continue to support our nation's small business community. Welcome Congressman and Congresswoman, and thank you for joining us to talk about the all important small business policy priorities. Now, before we get started, as you know, our series is called Common Grounds. It's based on the idea that coffee brings people together. <laughs> Things get done in Congress when people sit down together over a coffee or a burger a beer or a glass of wine, and they hash things out and come up with solutions. So before we dive into policy, let's talk about coffee for a minute. I'm drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee with <laughs> lots of milk and lots of sweetener. Congressman and Congresswoman, if you drink coffee, how do you take it? <laughs> well, usually I take mine in an IV drip, Tom, but for the purposes of today's discussion, I put mine in a thermos and I'm drinking our coffee from Minnesota, Penny's Coffee, straight, hot and black. Excellent. So I am drinking uh, Starbucks coffee, but I usually take a, a you know, watered down version of coffee because I drink it very, very light. <laughs> so this is also in my thermo because I love to drink for a long time and it keeps it warm. Oh, that's great, thank you. <laughs> now, both of you have owned and operated small businesses. Tell us a little bit about those businesses and how that perspective as a business owner has influenced your leadership in Congress. Congressman Phillips, let's start with you. So Tom, I was fortunate to grow up in a family that uh, was in business and made business a means to an end. Uh, the end in our family wasn't earning as much money as humanly possible, rather ensuring that those who made success possible, both our employees and the communities in which we operated, uh, did well as, as as well as we did, and that was our ethos. 
uh, and um, something that I have carried forward now in my own entrepreneurial pursuits. I've gone from the spirits business, then to the ice cream business, and now the coffee business, probably three things Congress could use a little bit more of. Uh, and to answer your question directly, what I bring to the table is empathy and understanding. Uh, I know how hard it is uh, to start a small business, to manage a small business, even in the best of times, and particularly in challenging times like everybody has endured over the past couple of years between uh, employee issues and capital access issues and market challenges, international competition, uh, regulatory issues, tax challenges. Uh, there's a lot that has to be navigated and uh, that empathy uh, goes a long way. And I'm thrilled uh, to be here with Congresswoman Kim too, who has that deep understanding and appreciation of what so many millions of Americans, the backbone of our economy are enduring right now. Well, Thank Congressman, I, I'm doing everything possible to stay in my seat, not jump up and applaud. Uh, both you and Congresswoman Kim have come and talked with our Small Business Council here at the chamber. And so I've seen firsthand that empathy and understanding from both of you. Congresswoman Kim, tell us a little bit about your uh, clothing manufacturing business and how that experience has shaped your leadership here in Congress. Sure, it's, uh, Tom. Thank you so much for having me and Congressman uh, Phillips uh, in a bipartisan uh, conversation like this. To answer your question, you know, after college, I worked as a financial analyst at a local bank. Uh, it was a bank holding company doing merger and acquisition, and that led me to working in a private sector when I was recruited by one of my clients to work uh, as a controller at a ladies' wear manufacturing company. And that eventually helped me to start my own business in the garment and fashion industry. So this was during the late 80s and early 90s when the industry was going through very tough financial crisis. So in order to stay operational and competitive, I adopted the practice of factoring accounts receivables into working capital. So we can help with the cash flow and keep the payroll and pay the contractors and so forth. And that experience has taught me the ways the government could facilitate or make, make it harder being an entrepreneur and small business owner. So now as a member of Congress, I've made it a priority to listen and learn from the small business owners about their challenges they face each and every day. What is working for them? What is not working for them? so that I can be informed policymaker to work on pro-business and pro-growth policies. And this is why I formed Small Business Advisory Group, and I regularly meet and visit with small businesses throughout my district. So I understand that, uh, again, as a small business owner myself, these, you know, many of the businesses in my district are mom and pop type shops. They are sorely operated by the owners themselves or their family and relatives. So we need to figure out how we can empower entrepreneurs and allow them to focus on what they do best rather than requiring them to become experts on how to comply with government regulations. Because oftentimes small businesses, mom and pop type stores, they do not have a full time HR or inside general counsel to be able to uh, follow all of these laws and rules and regulations that is passing through Congress or in the state. So we need to make it as much easier uh, to the small businesses as possible. Well, Congresswoman, it is music to my ears to hear your dedication to making it easier for small businesses. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit into your bipartisanship mm -hmm. together and, and really some bipartisan uh, victories that have happened over the last few years in Congress. Now, both of you played a major role in helping small businesses during the pandemic. Not many people know that Congress passed three laws in three weeks at the beginning of the pandemic, and then passed seven laws in 12 months, all bipartisan and all designed to specifically help small businesses. Why do you think your efforts were so successful? Congressman Phillips, uh, why don't you kick us off in, in giving some insight in how that moment or moments of crisis led to bipartisan activity? Well, first, you know, Congresswoman Kim and I are both members of the Problem Solvers Caucus, as we as you referenced earlier. And our ethos is a really simple one. It's a kindergarten lesson. You, know, you got to get to know each other and treat each other respectfully. 
you can't work with people you don't trust and you can't trust people you don't know. And Congress, unfortunately, I would argue that leadership on both sides of the aisle doesn't do enough to inspire cooperation and friendship and trust. So we have to do that on our own. And um, I did so with, uh, of all people, Chip Roy. I think I'm the 13th most bipartisan member of Congress. Chip is probably, I think he's 406. <laughs> and when we were talking uh, during the, the peak of COVID and uh, small businesses struggling to keep their lights on, he and I were hearing the exact same thing from our constituents. He down in Texas, me way up in Minnesota. And we recognized that the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a very successful program, had some challenges relative to the parameters and some of the uh, the, the elements of the bill itself. So we got together, we wrote a bill that fixed a lot of the challenges that business owners were telling us they had relative to the, uh, the window, uh, relative to what portion of the PPP funds had to be allocated to paychecks versus other expenses, rent, uh, paying uh, suppliers and the like. Uh, and we came together. If Chip and I can do that, Congress can do that. Uh, it passed the House with only one negative vote uh, I got to work harder on Tom Massey next time. And President President Trump signed it into law. So it does go to show uh, we hear an overwhelming amount of what we hear from our constituents all around the country, Tom, is the same. But we don't have good mechanisms, as businesses do, to bring what we learn to one another on both sides of the aisle. And that's why the Problem Solvers Caucus is such a perfect place to do so. Uh, in this case, it helped inspire that bill uh, that ethos of working together. And just one example of what can get done if people are simply willing to get to know each other. Well, thank you, Congressman. I, I do remember hearing from hundreds of small businesses, thank you for PPP, but please don't micromanage how I'm using it to keep my employees' paychecks coming and keeping the lights on. And so thank you for your leadership. Thank you, both of you for your leadership in trying to bring that message successfully to Washington and, and the passage of that PPP flexibility, which was critical for so many small businesses. Congresswoman Kim, can you explain a little bit about how your work during PPP and during COVID, COVID relief actually led to bipartisan efforts? Sure. And again, you heard from uh, my colleague, Dan Phillips here. Uh, the key was that at the time, there was a bipartisan agreement that we needed to save mom and pop shops from the lockdowns and health crisis caused by COVID-19. And the crisis showed the world that we could still work together for the good of the American people. While I didn't get the opportunity to serve with Dan in the 116th Congress when the PPP was enacted into law, one of my priorities serving as a newly elected member in the 117th Congress was to help small businesses get on their feet and overcome the economic downturn caused by COVID-19. So I knew that I would have that opportunity serving on the House Small Business Committee. My goal was to see a successful closure of the PPP that my colleagues in the 116th Congress enacted and ensure that the process for forgiveness was seamless for small business owners. So right at the beginning of my time in Congress, I was happy to work with my colleagues. Uh, it was another freshman that just got elected with me, uh, Caroline Boldo from Georgia. We got together and worked with our respective chair and re uh, ranking members of the Small Business Committee to introduce the Bipartisan Paycheck Protection Program Extension Act and get that signed into law just before the program was coming to an end at the end of March 2021. The legislation allowed that PPP to open for loan applications for two extra months until the end of May 2021. And remember, that small change allowed an estimated 2.7 million small business loans to be processed, and they distributed roughly $54 billion. And we did that without raising taxes or adding more money because we still had like trillions of dollars from the previous CARES fund for PPP. So this is something like it's it's a real common sense bipartisan solution that we were able to come up with because again, we saw the need, we came together and worked on a bipartisan solution. You know, Congresswoman, I, I love hearing just the common sense of it. You hear was a program designed to help, 
you were hearing from thousands, if not millions of small businesses to say, we just need a little bit more time. Yeah. We knew there was money still left in the PPP account. And for you to come together with Congresswoman Bordeaux from Georgia uh, mm -hmm. is another fantastic example of bringing that common sense, I would call it Main Street sensibility into <laughs> Washington to actually accomplish a bipartisan solution to help small business. So I applaud those efforts. Now, we're talking about policy. We can't talk about small business policy without talking about the I word. That I word, as you would suspect, is inflation. And unsurprisingly, recent data from our MetLife and U.S. Chamber of Commerce Small Business Index shows that inflation is the highest concern of small businesses right now. And in fact, two out of every three small businesses have had to raise prices just to keep up with the rising costs. Are there bipartisan policy solutions that could help? And I'll, I'll start with you first, Congresswoman Kim. Um, give us some insight in some of the work that you're working on in a bipartisan way to really help solve the inflation crisis that we're in right now. Sure. Happy to respond to that one because there have been bipartisan solutions that have passed out of the House that could really help ease price pressures that is caused by supply chain disruptions. So one that comes to my mind is HR 4996, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021. This is a legislation that could help ocean shipping policies and it could improve the movement of goods by ocean carriers. Then so this bill was part of the Compits Act and that has a good chance of being included in the final conference agreement. As a conferee, thankfully, for the uh, USICA and competes negotiations, I think it is also critical that we have successful agreement that can be signed into law. Many of the provisions being negotiated, like funding for CHIPS Act, they will assist our country bringing back semiconductor manufacturing capacity and better mitigating the risks of supply chain disruptions in China and other countries in Asia. You know, there is no silver blood to solving the supply chain crisis and preparing for future disruptions. That's that's why we send, including uh, Dean Phillips and I, we sent a letter asking our congressional leadership to establish the Select Committee on Supply Chain Crisis so we can come up with a comprehensive strategy to address our supply chain crisis. But the supply chain disruptions have as we know, it contributed to prices increasing, but also higher demand because of the lifting of COVID-19 lockdowns and an energy policy that instead of picking winners and losers, we should be pivoting to adopting a market approach that includes all of the above energy strategy. You know, I also have two legislation that I'm, you know, really still working on my uh, colleagues to get a bipartisan support and get it passed through the House right away is H.R. 7747, combating painful inflation. As the name says, we need to really see how this painful inflation is hurting our families, businesses and our pocketbooks. And another one is the, um, the Inflation Prevention Act. Uh, I joined my colleague, uh, uh, Mike Garcia and others. Uh, we're asking my colleagues not to pass any more measures that will add to inflation until year over year inflation rate drops below 4.5%. These are some of the bipartisan common sense solutions that we're uh, working on. And, um, you know, like I said, the Ocean Shipping Act has a very good chance of getting it into the final passage of the conference committee report. But the others, like I mentioned, combating painful inflation, inflation prevention. Act. These are some other things that we're working on in Congress right now. Well, thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, it actually makes me feel a lot more comfortable knowing that you're on the group of legislators who are trying to navigate the differences between the House passed bill and the Senate passed bill on legislation that has passed both houses, mm -hmm. but needs to be, the differences need to be ironed out in, in order for America to stay competitive. So I feel a lot better knowing that you're in that group of select legislators uh, and you're up to the task. Congressman Phillips, uh, same question to you. Inflation is on front of mind for every small business owner 
uh, what's your sense of bipartisan solutions that can help bring down that cost pressure that is really, uh, really a crisis right now on Main Street? Oh, it sure is, Tom. And, and Congresswoman Kim, I think, summed it up uh, quite well. It's unacceptable. Uh, it's not something uh, that members, at least of our generation, uh, have ever suffered from before. I remember being a little boy and knowing how high mortgage rates were because of my parents' conversations and how absurd inflation was then. I did not think we would be facing another period like this so soon, but here we are, uh, and we have to do something. I would argue in Congress, it's not so much what we can do to tame inflation, it's what we shouldn't do, and that is continue to add to the federal debt. Uh, under the Trump administration, of course, it went up by about a third, $7 trillion. The American Rescue Plan, absolutely, uh, added probably 100 to 250 basis points uh, to, uh, to our inflation figure. Inflation is an international challenge right now. We know that, as Congresswoman Kim said. Supply chains, uh, the disruption uh, has severely complicated matters. Uh, ocean shipping uh, enhancements would surely help that. But at the end of the day, we, when during low inflation times, we have equilibrium between supply and demand. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, a lot of people saved a lot of money. Demand skyrocketed and supplies went down. It's going to be at some time until uh, that rectifies itself. In the meantime, I think the Fed is taking appropriate steps. Uh, probably waited too long. Uh, it will not be easy or painless, uh, but it will be the lesser uh, of many evils as we try to keep inflation under control. I would also say the labor challenge is something that we can do in Congress. And I'm ashamed of Democrats and Republicans who have stood in the way of thoughtful immigration reform. Uh, my dear colleague is an example uh, of living the American dream. Uh, coming to this country for its abundance of opportunity. We should open our doors to people with aspirations, inspiration, uh, and entrepreneurship on their mind. Uh, that's how we solve the labor crunch, reduce inflation, and ensure that American businesses uh, have the labor supply they need. We would be repatriating a lot more manufacturing to the United States right now if companies knew that they had a labor force ready to meet their needs, and we don't. So there are some things Congress can and should be doing. We should be playing the long game, uh, and I hope we get to it. And the Problem Solvers Caucus and Rep. Kim and I uh, are on duty and looking forward to doing so. Well, thank you, Congressman. And I think I've shared with, with your teams that when we heard from small businesses and distilled what they want from Washington, we put that in a small business bill of rights. This is five basic principles small business owners say would help nurture the growth in startups that we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. And basically they asked for Congress to encourage, not micromanage entrepreneurial growth. Congressman Phillips, how do you react to small businesses telling Washington to adopt a hands-off attitude? I get it. I, I, I've worked in some of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States, uh, distilled spirits and, and food production. So believe me, I understand the burdens uh, of a very difficult regulatory environment. Uh, I know the cost uh, of compliance. You know, I also would argue, and I think it's all fair, to, we're, we all would recognize that it is the responsibility of the government to ensure consumer safety, consumer protection, uh, and some degree of thoughtful regulation. Uh, do we always get it right? No. Uh, in fact, this is a great time, Tom, to extend an invitation to everybody watching, to Representative Kim, to me, to the Small Business Committee uh, Chair and Ranking Member. Send us your ideas, your complaints, your criticisms, areas that we should be focusing on to make doing business easier. Not just regulations, um, but uh, all kind of, uh, provision of capital, working with the SBA. You know, how do we do better? Uh, I get it. Uh, I want to get out of the way, but also ensure that we have thoughtful regulations so that uh, protection intersects thoughtfully with entrepreneurship. And I think that's possible, but we need to hear from you. If we don't listen and convert what we hear into action, then shame on us, but we're ready to do so. Well, thank you, Congressman. And Congresswoman, I, I think Representative Phillips put it really well when he said there's that intersection yeah. between government involving and enabling versus getting out of the way of job creators and innovators. In your role, not only as a member of Congress, but as part of the 
Problem Solvers Caucus. How do you balance those two sometimes competing things so that small businesses feel helped by government, but don't feel crushed by government? Well, first of all, uh, you talk about the five basic principles. Um, to me, it's a no-brainer. And I think uh, my colleague, Dan, uh, also thinks the same way. The members from both sides of the aisle, we agree with most, if not all, of the principles laid out in your Small Business Bill of Rights. Uh, we need to get out of the way if we can. Government should get out of the way and make sure that the job creators do what they know best, and that is running their own business instead of policymakers thousands of miles away from where they do their business trying to dictate them what to do. I mean, there is times when the uh, government intervention is needed with the right pro-business, pro-growth policies. But I think uh, in general, if we can do a uh, hands off and uh, let the market and businesses do what they do best, I think would be the best thing. You know, uh, also, I want to uh, commend uh, my colleague, Dan, uh, because he and I partner in introducing HR 7552. It's the Gordon Premiership Act. And I know US Chamber, you endorsed it too. So thank you so much. This is a legislation that will provide entrepreneurs like six years old and up with SBA resources to learn more about business succession planning. And once uh, you know you are up and running, we want to also do like two year check in to ensure that the businesses that you started are actually succeeding. So that's the kind of thing that we want to do instead of you know meddling into your operation. We want to get out, but also provide the resources. And there are ways the federal government can be a great resource for small business. However, we also need to think very, very seriously about how federal regulations are burdening small businesses. The estimates from the American Action Forum who came before our small business committee to give uh, some updates on their findings, for example, have stated that federal agencies collectively finalized over $200 billion in net regulatory costs in 2021. That's a huge cost to the economy and small businesses. Many of those regulations disproportionately impact small businesses because it increases the cost of complying with onerous regulations by requiring them to hire lawyers and compliance officers. We need to take a serious look at how to decrease federal compliance costs for small businesses of all sizes. That's why I think we should look for bipartisan ways to increase the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act of 1996, for example. And again, problem solvers are discussing the legislation that are introduced. We come together and we try to get at least 75% of our uh, caucus members to endorse the legislation, and then we'll bring it collectively to the House floor for votes. Yeah. And Tom, if I might just say, too, that you know, I, I think government should be the wheelbarrow for small business, not the wall. And that means helping. Too often, anybody on this watching this that has started a small business that has faced local regulations and permitting and the challenges of opening a small business with state and local challenges. You know, I've already told our governor in Minnesota and, and our, our big city mayors uh, that there should be an office of small business advocacy. You should be able to pick up the phone call someone at the government, whether it's the SBA at the federal level or state and local um, uh, institutions, yeah. and find someone who's there to help you, not just tell you what you can't do and when you've made a mistake, but there to counsel you until you get your business open. That is, to me, how government can be a partner uh, to small business rather than an impediment. Well, Congressman and, and Congresswoman, thank you for really just narrowing right in that appropriate role of government and the private sector, because I love that expression, a wheelbarrow, not a wall. And I also, Congresswoman Kim, I, I applaud your leadership in the Goldenpreneurship Act. Uh, Congressman Phillips, as you know, because you're a co-sponsor of this legislation, this really leverages public-private partnerships to help an older generation of entrepreneurs and founders. And it is that leveraging of public and private partnerships that does have the balance, I think, mapped out pretty well between being a wheelbarrow, which is good, and being a wall that, that is bad. So now, more than ever, our nation needs leaders like the two of you, with the courage to reach across the aisle, pursue common ground, and forge real solutions to the challenges 
facing Main Street businesses, workers, families, and communities. If you have just one minute for closing remarks, and I'll start with you, Congresswoman Kim, and then turn to you, Congressman Phillips. Tell us why you're optimistic that the bipartisanship that we've talked about today can be achieved tomorrow, next week, next year, and in next Congress. Well, I'm optimistic because Dean and I are a testament of bipartisanship. We have worked together on mutual policy priorities and legislation. And more often than not, we're working in a bipartisan way as members of Problem Solvers Caucus, wanting to find common ground. And that's why we're always, you know, I mean, the press or media, they only report the partisanship or gridlock. But you know what? There is a lot more that brings us together and areas where we can work together. So get past that. And I'm not being naive, of course. There is much disagreement between both sides of the aisle, but there is also a lot of compromise that is being done for the good of the American people. Our founding fathers were the great compromisers, and we all need to do a better job in following their footsteps and ways of reaching consensus. And having a conversation with my colleague Dean like this, where we can agree or disagree cordially with decorum, that gives us real optimism about our future. You know, there is an often converse, conversation that talk about how women are consensus builders, problem solvers, and we get things done. But I think working in a bipartisan way, men and women can come together and be consensus builders, problem solvers, and get results. Congressman Phillips. Um, oh, I, couldn't say, I couldn't say it better. You know. <laughs> What my friend and colleague just said is so spot on. You know, we have an angertainment industry in the United States that is thriving on separating us, dividing us. You know, I think this country is divided only on screens. When we get out into our uh, neighborhoods, into our communities, into our businesses, we come together. You know, we are a remarkably, uh, I wouldn't say, hetero we are, you know what, we're a country that is filled with different opinions and different looking people and people praying differently and eating differently. That's the amazing part about America. That's the beautiful part of America. It's the only country in the world like it. And that's what should be our great strength. And I think that when all you see on TV at night are the bomb throwers and the dividers, the mean spirited members of Congress, it gives our country an image that uh, uh, things are heading off the cliff, that the dysfunction is uh, irretractable, but it's not. Most of us are actually people of decency and civility, different backgrounds. We disagree without being disagreeable. And I think, uh, as my friend and colleague said, you know, we have to take steps towards each other. Uh, we're not going to solve it in Congress, my friends. We can't legislate decency, civility, love, respect. Uh, that comes from each of us as individuals in our households and our businesses uh, and in our communities. And I think between the chamber, uh, convenings like this, uh, we can all make a big difference if we each take a step towards each other instead of away from each other. So with that, keep the faith and uh, thank you, Tom, for bringing us together. Well, thank you both. I think there's a lot to be said for friendship. Mm -hmm. And yep. Congressman Phillips, Congresswoman Kim, I appreciate all the work you're doing with your friends at the Problem Solvers Caucus. And I'm tremendously grateful for you joining us today for Common Grounds, participating in this discussion answering questions. And having great it, cup of coffee. Cheers. And, cheers. and having a great, <laughs> great cup of coffee. I do want to ask a favor. Please continue to raise the standard for civil and collaborative yeah. discourse in governing. And please keep setting the bar high for bipartisan leadership. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is going to have your back as you pursue hard but important compromises and solutions. Thank you both again. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having us. Now to our event attendees with us virtually, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Common Grounds.